Okay, court's back in session. <laughs> you know, uh, last August, we made a trip up to uh, Estes Park, Colorado, up to a high mountain. We were called up into a high mountain to uh, uh, do some uh, investigation and consultation. And uh, we discovered that it was... Uh, it was basically a meeting of the Council of the Lord. Not that we're the only Council of the Lord, but, but on a meeting of this uh, caliber, we needed at least 10 people involved, to, you know, as a minimum. Uh, our job really is to turn all of you into Council of the Lord members <laughs> uh, because, you know, as we learn more and and are, and are able to hear his voice and discern and to learn our way around the, the divine court system. Uh, really, everybody uh, has the potential of being called into, uh, into some kind of a session like that. It doesn't have to involve me or any of us, but we're, you know, but it happened it, in August we were called up to do that. And so... Uh, there have been others as well that have uh, understood this kind of thing. But the, the word, uh, the Hebrew word is sod. In, um, uh, in, in, it's translated the council or the council of the Lord. And uh, it is something that uh, is part of, uh, part of the divine court system, but not necessarily a part of it. But it has to do with certain court cases. Uh, the counsel of the Lord is mentioned in Jeremiah 23, 18. It says, But who has stood in the counsel of the Lord that he should see and hear his word? Who has given heed to his word and listened? So uh, the prophet was chiding the other prophets of his day who were prophesying peace for Jerusalem when God intended to destroy the city. In other words, they really didn't hear the counsel of the Lord. They were, they were giving prophecies out of the idols of their own heart. And so he's, he's saying, you should have stood in the counsel of the Lord, uh, meaning really you should have heard his voice so that you would know what was going to happen so you wouldn't be prophesying falsely. Now the word sowed, uh, it literally means a pillow or a cushion to sit on as a person converses with friends. The lexicon the, in the uh, blueletterbible.org uh, defines it saying it's a sitting together, an assembly, either of friends familiarly conversing uh, or of judges consulting together in secret or a secret. And it lists uh, Jeremiah 6.11 Jeremiah 15, 17, and some other uh, passages. Um, the council is made up of both men and angels. Its main purpose is to obtain two witnesses, heaven and earth, to establish all things. Most of the discussion in the council is to allow men to know the will of heaven uh, so they can bear witness on earth that they, which they have seen and heard. Uh, Jeremiah 23, verse 22 says, But if they had stood in the council, then they would have announced my words to my people and would have turned them back from their evil way and from the evil of their deeds. Uh, in other words, if the prophets in Jeremiah's day had stood in the council, as it says, they could have known the will of God and the fate of Jerusalem. Unfortunately, the prophets relied upon their dreams or their, uh, their claims when they, you know, they said that they had a dream or a vision, but they did not stand in the council. The result was that they disagreed with Jeremiah, who was obviously familiar with the council of the Lord, having received his revelation through that council. The other prophets preached that God would never destroy Jerusalem. Uh, probably arguing that the Jews were God's chosen people and that God would never disgrace himself by allowing his temple to be destroyed or desecrated. And we see a similar situation today. Most of the prophets 
again, cannot believe that Jerusalem is Hagar and must be cast out in favor of Sarah and her children. They can't believe that. They just, they, they, they have this uh, uh, blockage, which I believe is an idol in the heart. And uh, so they basically disagree with the Apostle Paul in his whole discussion, lengthy discussion in Galatians 4. <clears throat> Ezekiel 13, 9 says, So my hand will be against the prophets who see false visions and utter lying divinations. They will have no place in the council of my people, nor will they be written in the register of the house of Israel, nor will they enter the land of Israel, that you, that you may know that I am the Lord. So it's called here the council of my people. To be my people, one must follow the God of the Bible, the, the God of Israel. Uh, in other words, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> So, let's see, Psalm 89, 6 and 7, another passage here, it says, For who in the skies is comparable to the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty is like the Lord? A God greatly feared in the council, or greatly respected in the council of the holy ones, and awesome above all those who are around him. So here it's called the council of the holy ones or of the saints or angels. You can translate that in various ways. Obviously, the council of the Lord does not mean that the Lord needs a council to come to any conclusion. Uh, there were Jews in times past and rabbis who fancied that God consulted the rabbis about what to do in the earth as if God needed help in making good decisions. Uh, the truth is that the purpose of the council is for men to learn the will and the mind of God. Uh, and that's really the purpose of our gathering as well uh, in, uh, in the mountain uh, in early August. It took three days of discussion before we finally really came to a conclusion and fully felt like we knew the mind of God in the situation where we could then present the case properly to uh, the divine court. So, you know, most cases it doesn't require quite so much preparation, and often not that many people, but, uh, but in this case, this was something different. We had really never done anything on this level uh, in the past. And so it was a sort of a new experience for us. It was a learning experience. And, uh, but it was actually, it was a very good time of fellowship and uh, um, discussion, once in a while, lively. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, I'm not, I don't want to reveal secrets or anything. But no, we, you know, it was, uh, you know, we, we all came in with, with uh, certain ideas or, or beliefs or this is the way it's normally done. Uh, but the whole purpose of gathering together was to come to a consensus where we got the mind of God. Now, this is a kind of thing that a uh, uh, that, uh, number of us had already done on smaller scales in the past. For me, it goes back to uh, 1985, where we used to gather uh, down in northern Arkansas here and and uh, get the word of the Lord. And we, we met uh, Friday night or Saturday night, and uh, we would meet, get around the table, discuss. And, uh, you know, I usually started by giving a, a sort of a, a synopsis to bring us up to speed as to what God had done since we had met last, which was about a week earlier. And so that we... Uh, then we asked, we were essentially asking God, what is it that, why have you gathered us here tonight? What is it you want us to do? What is your will? What is your mind? And it, it always took at least a couple of hours and sometimes four. And I remember once it was about six hours. We didn't get out until about two in the morning once, I remember. Sometimes it just takes longer. 
But I was generally the scribe, and when people would get a word or a scripture or a vision or something or some discernment, we, you know, they would speak up, we'd write it down, and, uh, and we didn't really know what direction this was taking until that last piece of the puzzle was put in. And then suddenly it all came to light. We knew, we, we got the picture, and once we knew the mind of God, which might take hours, then we just simply decreed what God was saying. We declared it in the earth, and that generally took about five minutes. So most of our time was spent in discerning his word and getting his mind. And once you knew his mind, then you simply speak it into the earth in agreement with him. Anytime we speak a word that is in agreement with him, you're always going to get results. If we're in disagreement with him, then we don't get so good results. But the idea is to go beyond obedience into agreement. The whole idea uh, of the Christian, why, uh, the Christian life and our walk with God is to come to that place of agreement. And once we're in agreement, then uh, everything's fine. You're at peace with him. Peace, agreement, harmony. And, and uh, being in agreement with God gives you the right to speak for him. Kind of interesting, uh, uh, all these things, you know, uh, come back to me from, from literally 30 years ago. Uh, and uh, so here we are, we're back just near, near to the original place, Batesville, Arkansas, northern Arkansas. And uh, so now that we're back here, we get, uh, we get our friends here and uh, uh, we've got some folks here that were a part of that original round table, square table discussion groups. And so they can, uh, they can vouch for you. Uh, couple over here, uh, James and Bobby, I haven't seen them in, what, 20 years? Why don't you stand up just so they can see who you are? This is James and Bobby. Yeah, they've been married 30 years, I know, I married them. And so, uh, <clears throat> but we met many times at their house or, or, or somebody else's, but they were there and uh, were really uh, uh, back in those days, you know, we were, uh, we, we were very, very, you know, close. And we, we grew up together in this kind of uh, message or technique or this, you know, ability to hear his voice. So uh, it's really nice. I'm really, really glad, you know, they were able to come on up. We got a, uh, a conference was close enough for them to come. And so, uh, so we, got, we got a family reunion going on over here. So that's why we're a few minutes late. Uh, so anyway. Um, <clears throat> so then anyway, I, I just want to share a little bit about this uh, Council of the Lord thing because this is sort of a new revelation for me too. Uh, the terminology is a little bit new. But it's actually right there in Scripture. There's many places in Scripture where you can actually look this up. But all of our early training to... to come to this place of the Council of the Lord really started way back there in uh, Batesville, Arkansas, back in the mid-1980s. Uh, back in those days, of course, it wasn't called the Council of the Lord. Uh, in fact, we didn't call it anything, but there were other people who, they, uh, they looked at us, oh no, here comes the God Squad again. You know? <laughs> so it, the name kind of stuck. So back in those days, it was called the God Squad. <laughs> Anyway, uh, <clears throat> so there's been a long progression uh, of, of time where the Lord has, has really trained us little by little over the years. Um, you know, from Arkansas, we went to Seattle where we essentially did the same thing. Um, we had three couples there. 
Uh, one of them isn't with us here today, but uh, we got, there's two of us out of, out of three. Uh, Dave and Sherry, they're doing part of the uh, equipment there. Why don't you stand up so that people can see you? Dave and Sherry Weaver. I've been really blessed with having people, friends around me that, could, uh, that I could bounce things off of and we could learn and grow together. And that's really important. I know many, of, many people, you know, they sort of feel like they're all alone out there. And I don't know what to do about it other than have conferences where you can meet each other and hopefully get together once in a while. And now, of course, in recent years, we have the technology where we can actually keep in touch uh, and it doesn't cost an arm and a leg by the old telephone system, you know, it costs 10 cents an hour or 10 cents a minute or something like that. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, today that's, that's today's price. But if you remember, it wasn't long ago we were, we were paying 10 cents a, a minute to talk long distance and then we thought, oh, we're doing really good. It went down to two cents a minute. Well, that's all old technology apparently sort of faded away and now we just, now we just, uh, uh, you know, pay a thousand dollars a month now just to... <laughs> they don't charge by the minute anymore. Now they just charge by the month. So, uh, but anyway, <clears throat> one way or the other we're able to keep, uh, keep in touch. And so uh, there's, uh, the, the, we did bring up uh, earlier one uh, prayer request with uh, Lauren Matsky, and we just uh, less about an hour ago got a report from him. Uh, uh, was that Wayne? Uh, would you uh, uh, share with us what that is? Maybe you can read it on your cell phone. You can turn it on again, and uh, unless unless uh, Lynn wants to. Of course, we send our blessings upon both Lauren and Margaret. Uh, may the Lord bless them and keep them in his perfect will. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, Mike, would you come up and uh, share a bit? This is about the uh, uh, the Council of the Lord meeting. We we got we got a favorable verdict last August, and the Lord has saved it for us today to make the declaration to be in agreement with the verdict that we got. I always wondered what it looked like from be up here, see, see the front of your faces rather than the back. Um, I don't want to take all your time, Stephen, but I, I do have a couple things I want to say. Uh, 
Ron has always said, you know, that uh, when he first started studying and stuff, he asked God to give him the greatest Bible teacher uh, he had for him, you know. And, of course, he says Stephen was given to him, you know. To show where we were at, we didn't even know enough to ask. And he still gave him to us, so we were, we were doubly blessed uh, in that case. Um, it, well, before I start, I want my wife to stand up. Uh, we do everything together. It's a uh, covenant marriage that we have. It's very dear to me. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, maybe I can get by that. When we were up in the mountains, uh, I don't want to say God tricked us, but I thought we were going for a vacation. <laughs> and uh, it didn't quite turn out that way. Not that that was bad. It was good. Uh, it, was, it was kind of a... Uh, work in progress for the whole time and you know God uses all people for various uh, things and and what it showed to me was is that with Kathy and I he can use any if he can use us he can use anybody uh, and he can use you uh, I'm just amazed uh, when I look around and see all you people uh, not only here but people that I know that are out there the gifts that they have, uh, that they give every day. I'm just amazed at uh, what they have, what they are, and what they give through the, through the Father. Uh, like Stephen said, when we were out there, uh, it took a little while to work through things, but we did work through uh, what needed to be worked through. Um, and then we had, uh, um, what was it, about an hour and a half that we actually answered uh, all of the questions and what was interesting was in, in the past most of the time we, we made a decree after uh, something was done in this case we just had the verdict that the uh, uh, judge had given us in the court which one of our friends pointed out a couple times to us uh, which was good because it seems like now is the time to declare that verdict uh, into all creation um, and so to do that, I, I'd like to start out uh, with a short prayer um, that we usually pray when we, when we do anything. So if you join me, uh, um, Father, we come before you with thanksgiving and praise. We repent and we remit all our sins, iniquities, transgressions, and heart idols to you, Father. Thank you for forgiving them all and covering us with the blood of Jesus. We forgive everyone who sinned and trespassed against us, and we forgive ourselves. Thank you, Father, that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Amen and amen. amen. In Jesus name, amen. And I just want you to know you are all in Christ Jesus, so there is no condemnation. It's a process of working it out. Um, I'm not going to go through this sheet here. <laughs> There's a lot of pages that Stephen wrote about uh, the whole process and uh, the actual uh, court case and the hour and a half uh, verdict and everything, but there are copies of these over there uh, that, that you can pick up and look at. Uh, when I think back through, when we actually did the, did the uh, court session, it, it was so dynamic that it just, it brings tears to my eyes to, to know all that was done at that time. So <clears throat> we have the privilege, you and I, because as overcomers or overcomer potential, you were all there. And we were only representing you, uh, which we felt very honored uh, to have been able to do that. I want you to know that <clears throat> you can read this, uh, but you can also in the spirit go back and actually experience it through the Spirit, what we experienced, because it is a dynamic thing uh, that he did. Uh, the verdict that we, I'm not going to go through all of it, but the verdict was for the restoration of all creation, which is unbelievable to me. So if you join me now, we're going to make that decree. Father, we thank you for that verdict 
of the restoration of all, of all creation, and we now decree that the restoration of all de creation to all creation. Amen. Thank you, Father. We now send your holy angels to carry out that decree. Thank you. Amen and amen. Now, I ran off about 120 of these, so uh, one per couple I think would be fine. At the end of the conference, if you want more, uh, if they're there, you're welcome to them. So it's, it's rather long, um, I don't know, I guess it's close to 30 pages, but, uh, uh, but I wanted you to have, uh, have a copy of that so that it would be a matter of public record uh, about the evidence that we presented to the Divine Court. Uh, and a lot of that, e well, most of that evidence was, maybe all of it, was simply holding God's feet to the fire. This is His promise, not mine. And so we're saying, hey, you promised, that's the evidence. Uh, and, and so we are only asking and petitioning that God keeps His promise. In my book, that's a surefire answer where we're going to get a favorable verdict. The interesting thing about, uh, about uh, the promises of God, you start to learn what the promises of God by, by looking at the contrast, the promises of men. And in so doing, when you see the the promises of men, it's always based in some way on the Old Covenant. Because the Old Covenant was a promise of men. You can read it in Exodus 19, where all the people said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do and be obedient. And they took this vow. And not one of, the, not one of us has ever been able to fulfill that vow. I mean, other than Jesus. But there, are, uh, there, there is an interesting law, which we brought in also, that tells you what to do in case you make a rash vow. Which is sort of what they did in Exodus 19. And it's in Leviticus 5, verses 4 through 10. And that forms part four, the testimony of the church. If a person swears thought, thoughtlessly with his lips to do evil or to do good, in whatever matter a man may speak thoughtlessly with an oath, and it's hidden from him, he doesn't understand what he's saying, and then he comes to know it, he will be guilty in these. So it shall be when he becomes guilty in one of these, he shall confess in that which he has sinned. In other words, Acknowledge that you have not been able to fulfill your vow. And then he's supposed to make a, uh, bring, bring an animal for a sin offering. And it says, the priest shall make atonement on behalf for his sin. Israel did this at Mount Sinai. They made a thoughtless vow. Well, I mean, it was in the plan of God that they do it. God actually required them to do it. But it turned out to be a case where they could not fulfill it. So what do you do? Well, you bring your sacrifice, which of course, you put it under the blood of Jesus, and confess the guilt, you know, sorry, we can't keep our vow. The old covenant can't save us because I can't keep, I can't keep the vow that I, that I made or that our forefathers made. And so then the priest shall make atonement or covers the sin with the blood. Many people have made vows and they think that they absolutely have to keep it even though it turns out you really can't keep it. Uh, 
or something like that. And if you, you know, you should do what you can to keep your vows, of course. But if, but if you, if you find yourself in a position like that, it isn't the end of the world. The law has made provision to cover that sin. And of course, we know that there isn't any sin that the blood of Jesus can't cover in the end. And so the law is very clear on that. And of course, we have to understand the law in terms of the, of the new covenant. You know, there's no, uh, there isn't any blood of animals that can cover sin forever. It was a temporary thing. But the blood of Jesus is once for all, and it, 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 it does the job completely. And if we understand that, which of course I know uh, all, virtually all of you understand that, uh, then, then there's no problem. But the uh, uh, man's vow has put him under the law. The term under the law means that the law has something against you because you haven't kept your vow. Anytime we sin, the law has, takes an interest in you. But when, when you deal with it and come back into a position of honor in the law, where you have a free relationship in the, with, the, with the judge and, uh, and in the court, you're not under the law because you're not, there's no arrest warrant that is, has been issued that is still outstanding. The one thing about moving around in the divine court is that you have to be in right standing with the court and with the judge. If you come and there's an arrest warrant out for you, how are you going to present your case before the bailiff takes you out and locks you up? You see? You can't, you can't come and present a case properly if, uh, if the law has something against you. Uh, because then you are, you are not an attorney, you are the criminal. <laughs> right? In order to be in, in a position of an attorney, you need to be in compliance with the decrees of the court and be at peace with all things. So how do you do that? Well, repentance. Put the blood of Jesus over it. And probably just as important to understand that uh, uh, by faith, we are attaching the penalty for my sin to the cross where Jesus has paid it. So if I owe, because all sin is reckoned as a debt, so if I sin, I owe, and if I owe something, uh, how am I going to pay? Well, if I can't pay, which nobody can really pay, but if, if I can't pay for the sin, somebody's going to have to do it in order to satisfy the law. And Jesus came and paid the penalty for sin. So because he has paid it, then we no longer have to pay it, and then the law has no more uh, interest in us because it has nothing to enforce anymore because you're at peace with it, and the law goes and looks for some other criminal. In other words, once the, once the debt has been paid, we are not under the law anymore. Does that mean we can go and sin that grace may abound? Obviously not. Sin is a transgression of the law. If we go and, and think that grace allows us to go and sin, you know, continue in sin, that grace may abound, we've missed the whole boat on this, as Paul says in Romans 6. We just don't understand what's really going on. Paul says, how can we continue in sin when, you know, I mean, it just doesn't make sense to the Apostle Paul. So our violation of the law after this uh, it doesn't make sense after we've been forgiven so that we're at peace with the law and with the judge and the court, how can we go and sin some more? And then, you see, being disobedient in that sense really tends to uh, disqualify us from holding court cases. So we found that the first thing that we really need to do is to make sure that we cleanse the house 
make sure that you know you you come and if there's anything that has been done uh, that is where we're we're not in compliance or really where we're not in agreement with the with the judge and his law that God would forgive us for it and and change our hearts so that we are in agreement because ultimately we need to be in agreement with him it's more than being obedient obedience is good but obedience implies that we would rather not do it and if our flesh had its way we would uh, be doing something else so obedience is where we force ourselves to do something whether we agree with it or not and that's uh, that's okay it's better than the alternative it's better than rebellion but ultimately our position is to come to a place where we're in agreement we wouldn't want to do anything other than what his character is his rules his his laws his mind everything uh, when we come fully into conformity to him uh, the the desire to sin leaves us completely well I'm not quite there yet but uh, but we're getting there um, you know my flesh I st you know I still I still fight with the flesh too not nearly as much as I used to uh, I am I am making progress thank God you may not see it but hey I tell you I am making progress I'm not the same person as I was 10 years ago or 20 or 30 uh, my wife can bear witness on all this and uh, but don't ask her please <laughs> anyway um, a few years ago a few years ago we uh, posted a prophetic declaration of identity in other words who are you I want to read that again we need to revisit this because you need to know that God has called you people not just you but certainly if you're here I believe God has called you to uh, uh, to be a part of this kingdom building process he hasn't just called you to go to heaven when you die he hasn't just called you to be raptured into the sky where you can have that great retirement program up there he has not called us to retire he has called us to build something to do a work in the earth he's not going to take us off the earth because if he does then what's left nothing left but except everything that needs to be burned and so then you get this theology about the whole earth getting burned up and that's the end of it but this earth was created to be a, a, a witness of heaven a witness of his kingdom and you are part of that earth being made of the dust of the ground and so your earth has a calling that calling is to bear witness to God is to glorify him in every way to glorify him in our bodies and so that's why he we are called his temples because he comes to indwell us and so we're, we have come to the time in history where we have seen the transfer of authority that uh, uh, that is at the other end of history from 2600 years ago when the transfer of authority occurred in the time of Nebuchadnezzar this was because of the judgment of the sin of Judah and the monarchy and the uh, uh, and the people who demanded they didn't want to follow God's law they were not in agreement with God at all and so because the dominion mandate was was abused God took it from them which he had every right to do and give it to somebody that had no calling in this regard but they had a legal uh, a legal calling that is they had a legal right to exercise dominion over the earth and these people weren't even believers 
Now, a lot, now a lot of people don't think that God does things like that, but this is a big part of the Bible story. When Israel was in sin, God always ended up removing the authority from them and giving it to some other nation and then putting that nation over Israel. So it's called a captivity. And a captivity is something God did. And if, if prophets in that day of a captivity began to rebuke Satan and uh, rebuke, uh, you, know, you know, I cast you out, you Moabites and you Midianites and you all the other parasites and, you know, you can, you can speak all you want against that, but it's, you're only contradicting the decree from the divine court because God has empowered them and there's nothing you can say to overrule God. You are not the Supreme Court over God. And yet, I know that they did it back then because they still do it today. And people are still people. It still happens all the time. So we need to know what the will of God is so we can be in agreement and not start issuing decrees that, God, uh, that contradict what God is doing. Well, we have come now to the end of that decree because all of the judgments of God are, are timed. There's a time limit on all judgment. And we have come to the end of this major judgment, and God has now decreed as of tabernacles of last year, our conference last year, where the transfer of authority is now complete. And then uh, uh, six months later in April, uh, at the time of Passover, we, uh, we saw that as the coronation of Christ and the overcomers as well, you know, the head and the body. Um, and so that was a, a progression. Now we have come into his household so that we can rule and reign with him from a position of a chateau. Okay? This is the castle on the hill, if you will. This is the symbolism that God has picked uh, at this time as a progression to show us that we, we function from a position of being in his household in agreement with him as sons and daughters of God. That makes sense? And so I want to read this again really as a prophetic declaration um, to you as to who you are. And of course, originally a few years ago, you know, this got put up on my mirror uh, at the office back home. And so when I went in there, I could look myself in the eye and speak these words to my spirit and remind me of who I am in Christ. It is about the new creation man. It is not about the old man from Adam. The old man from Adam does not, cannot, uh, and will never become what this decree is about. He's already been sentenced to death, and you're never going to raise him from the dead. Amen. God has a different way of doing it. It's like Jacob went into captivity, but Israel returned as the remnant. Okay? Jacob has to die. Israel is the new creation man. And so it is with us. You see, we have, uh, we have a genealogy that goes back to whoever. doesn't matter. And, uh, but that is a fleshly genealogy, and that is the man that is not going to be ruling. That's the man that has been given... Uh, the first opportunity to get the job done. But of course, all flesh has failed. But Paul talks about the two eyes, you know, eye this and eye that. And the one eye cannot do what Paul wanted, wanted to do. But he says, it's no longer I, it's no longer this eye, but it's this eye. And it's this new creation man that has been begotten by the Father in heaven and not by our earthly fathers on earth. And it's this new creation man that's in us, that is the real you. And that real you is what is going to rule and reign. That is what you are becoming. 
That is what will come about at the resurrection of the dead. And that's why it doesn't matter if you got eaten by sharks or burned up in a fire or just plain got buried or whatever the case is. It doesn't matter what your flesh, uh, the condition of your flesh when you, you know, when you die. That, that's not important. Some people get really uh, worried about that. You know, oh, you know, you know what, if, uh, what if this, what if that? It doesn't matter. That's not what's getting raised up. What's getting raised up is that new creation man that is in you, and that will become a new creation, and it's the real you. So if we understand that, then I can say, you are a son or daughter of God, begotten by the Holy Spirit, a child of promise. You have been given the birthright with all the blessings of heaven and earth at your disposal to be used in accordance with the divine plan that the Spirit is outworking in the earth daily. As part of the body of Christ, positioned under the head, you have been given all authority in both heaven and in earth. It is your calling to have dominion over the creation itself and to exercise that authority as Jesus Christ did when he ministered in the earth. You have authority over time and distance, governments, principalities and powers, nature, disease, and death itself. You are the righteousness of God in Christ, called to show forth the glory of God to every creature that all may know both the character and the works of God through you. So come forth this day, I speak to you, come forth this day and subdue all things under your feet. Bring order out of chaos, deliverance from bondage, light out of darkness, health out of sickness, and life out of death. Amen. 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 I believe that this is the beginning, or this, this conference here, it's the end of a cleansing time, but cleansing time is always preparation for something else. So the question is, okay, what does this, what does this time mark, the beginning of? It's the end of, uh, of this 76 days of cleansing that we've been doing as well, but what does it also begin? There's something new that, that is happening uh, at this conference. We're in the transition right now into something new. What's going on in the next year, two, or, you know, or a thousand years, or whatever? And I believe that we have been prepared now to do something uh, afterwards. And prophetically, uh, God has given us this time to prepare ourselves, cleanse the house, so that uh, we, can, we can be pictured like this chateau here of a cleansed house. When you, when you come in and look at this house, think of this, this is a picture of you, the real you. Okay, it's, in fact, it's, it's only a dim picture because you're, you're a whole lot better than this. This is made out of, uh, you know, uh, like a castle, you know, with great stones and, uh, and all that. It's a beautiful place, but no way can any physical structure, not even the temple of God in Jerusalem itself, could ever match up with the real you. Hallelujah. The real temple is made out of living stones. Even Solomon admitted that this great temple, it, how could this possibly house the glory of God? There isn't any temple on earth that could. In fact, all of heaven and earth couldn't, could, not, uh, could not comprehend or do justice to the God of heaven. So God was not really looking for earthly material uh, in wooden stones. He's looking for living stones in which to inhabit, both personally and as a corporate body. And these living stones, you are those living stones that he indwells. And this is the essential difference between true Christianity and every other religion 
in the world. Nobody else, no other religion has the revelation of the sons of God. At best, they, they look to be the best servant of God, the best slave of God, but we have come to a position of something beyond that. We are not only servants, we are sons and daughters of God. We're part of the family. There isn't any other belief system that has this. In fact, they think, who do you think you are? And they think it's blasphemous to think that we might be called the sons of God. Even in the New Testament, you know, the Gnostics who thought that they were really, you know, righteous and spiritual and all that, they did not believe that a good God could have anything to do with human flesh. They thought spirit was good, matter was evil. Therefore, the devil must have created matter. So they created this devil figure called the Demiurge, that was their term, uh, who they said was the creator of all these things. That is totally contradicted right from the beginning, Genesis 1.1. And so the Bible is, is the opposite of, uh, of that kind of religion. But you see, <clears throat> They do not have the revelation of Christ in you, the hope of glory. They're trying really hard by an old covenant method to become good enough to qualify as a good servant of God. That's the best they can come up with. We have so much more than that. And yet so much of Christianity is old covenant religion. They, really, they may talk about sons of God, but in reality, their vision is much lower than that. And they try so hard to beat the flesh into submission so that they can convert the flesh and turn it into sons of God. But I'm sorry, but your, your fleshly genealogy is never going to make that at all. And if you depend upon your fleshly genealogy to make you a son of God, Lots of luck, because it's not going to work. But I know that you, you folks know this because, you know, we've done this teaching uh, many times. Most of you have been following along for quite some time. And you understand that uh, there's a difference between being begotten by your earthly parents and being begotten by the Father. Amen. To be begotten by the Father means that you're pregnant with Christ in you, the hope of glory. This begetting is very real, but it's by faith. It is not by earthly genealogy. That is a whole different ball game. The earthly genealogy try, has tried to do it, and boy, I tell you, I struggled with that for years myself. And every time, every night, I do inventory, and I had to repent and confess and get saved all over again. I got saved more than you all. <laughs> what's, uh, let's see, what's 365 times five? Whatever that is, that's what I did uh, for, the, for five years out of my life, trying to, trying to fulfill my old covenant vow. And I finally gave up and realized it wasn't based on that. And that was, I think, my first revelation when I was 13. 1825. <laughs> yeah. It was shortly after the last dinosaur died. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, uh, in many ways, understanding sonship is, is easy. It's simple. But it's so simple, we say, it can't be that easy. It's just by faith. It's too simple. So we have to try to manipulate our flesh and try to beat it into submission until we become perfect in our flesh. And we, we spend all this time trying to be perfected by the flesh. And then we get discouraged. And the only antidote to discouragement uh, in that sense is be unrealistic. Some people think, oh yeah, I'm perfect now. And that's their way of dealing with their imperfection. 
They can't handle the fact that the flesh, you know, they can't handle the truth. And so they begin to uh, pretend and hope that it happens if they just affirm this with positive thinking. And if you just do this enough, then somehow your flesh is going to be perfected. Well, God bless all those who do positive thinking. All that is okay, but it isn't faith. It isn't faith. Positive thinking is something that comes out of your soul. Faith is something that comes out of your spirit. And you don't know the difference except through time. Time will prove out all things. Time is very important. And so, when we know who we are, and we are that which has been begotten by our Heavenly Father, then you don't have to try to be perfect. You are perfect already. Your flesh will never be, your flesh can try all it wants and it'll never get there. Your new creation man can't help it. He's already perfect because he has a heavenly father. He's not connected to the old man, the man of sin. And so it's because of your father that your new creation man cannot sin. And this is what uh, John tells us in 1 John. Uh, it's mistranslated a bit, kind of badly, uh, in, the, in most translations, because they didn't, they didn't really understand what sonship was. But he says that uh, uh, he cannot sin because he is begotten of God. And that is a tremendous principle. Whatever is begotten of God cannot sin because his seed remains in him, abides in him, and he cannot sin because he's begotten of God. The verse is often um, translated born rather than begotten, and that's unfortunate because it hides, it hides the truth of being begotten of God. See, the difference between begetting and birthing, being born, is about nine months. Begetting is something that father does. Birthing is something mother does. Okay? So it does make a difference how you translate that. <laughs> But if his seed remains in us, how did that seed get in there? That is the begetting process. And it's the holy seed of God that has begotten Christ in you. So that is the entity, that is the real you that, that you need to identify with because whatever you declare in the courts of God as to who you are, that is who you are. You are who you say you are. So don't go before the divine court and say, you know, uh, I am my flesh. I'm sorry. Hey, what are you doing in here? You see? You go in with the presumption that you are speaking, you are giving voice to the, the new creation man that is in you. That is what is speaking through your body. And so when you go before the divine court, Make sure it's your new creation man, and, uh, uh, and then you're in agreement because the new creation man is always in agreement with his father. You're chip off the old block. In the Hebrew, the term sons of God, or the term son, uh, had a much broader meaning than uh, many of us uh, are, are aware of or used to. If you resemble anything, you're a son of that entity or that person. So we have ch children of wisdom, children of light, you know, sons of God, sons of the devil, son of a gun. Um, uh, or if you go down the street, you see the sign, sons of riches. Um, oh, well. <laughs> anyway, you know, we, we, use that, we use that term, and, and it is a metaphorical term. If you're a son of Abraham, it means you, you resemble him in, the, in this area of faith. Abraham, the father of faith, means we as, if we have faith, it is by faith that we receive that holy seed from above by which we are begotten, and that makes us the sons of God, or even the sons of Abraham, because it's the son of our father, the father of faith. 
So understand your position and understand also that this castle that we're in right now, this beautiful uh, location, uh, is a divine picture, a representation of your new creation man and where you live and your position in Christ from which you can do all things through him who strengthens you. Okay? Why don't you stand and let's close in prayer. <clears throat> Our Father, we thank you for your promises. Thank you for begetting us and for revealing to us the new creation man. Thank you for bringing us to this place where we can have an illustration of the position that we have in you. Where we dwell with you, you abide with us and we with you in uh, in your house that has now been cleansed. And we thank you, Father, for all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. In Jesus name.